Okay, so welcome to the uh, to the first uh, Q Farm seminar of uh, the 2022-2023 uh, academic year. Uh, we're very fortunate for our first speaker to have uh, Ana Asenio from uh, Colombia. She uh, did her bachelor's, uh, master's, and PhD. Uh, I, I, I speak French and English uh, and Python, no Spanish, but I'm going to try. University that come to Can you That's a good approximation. Please. Uh. <laughs> <laughs> He's like, I don't want to embarrass you. He's already embarrassed himself or not. Uh, and then she was an IQIM uh, and Marie Curie postdoc fellow uh, at Caltech and also a postdoc uh, at Digpo. Um, and since then, she's moved uh, to Columbia just in time for the pandemic. So uh, Anna is uh, an expert in quantum optics, and especially in a field that she's been pioneering, studying short-range uh, light-mediated interactions between atoms and how that can lead to subradiance and superradiance in a whole new paradigm uh, of quantum optics. So we're very fortunate to have her today. Uh, Anna, let's give her a warm welcome. Thank you so much for the introduction and for the invitation. It's uh, very exciting to be here today and I've been able to share with you our work. Um, so before I start, uh, if please, if you have any questions, just interrupt me. I'm happy to take them at any time. Uh, but they have to be from students, at least the first two, right? Uh -huh. no, at the end. They at the end, OK. Students. So then, like, <laughs> the anyone, faculty. Anyone who wants to derail the talk during is absolutely <laughs> <It's> allowed. <laughs> <laughs> okay. <laughs> Great. Um, OK. So um, today, I'm going to be talking uh, about many body physics and self-organization in open quantum systems. And Pretty much, I'm very interested in how collective phenomena arises in this type of system and how to harness that collective behavior to develop efficient quantum applications. So the many body problem where we have many quantum particles interacting with each other is a hard problem. And this is because in this type of uh, situations with many particles, you have uh, emergent behavior uh, that arises because of interactions and that is very, very hard to predict from um, the microscopic or studying the individual systems. So in the classical realm, we have examples uh, such as, for instance, uh, avalanches. So we cannot predict an avalanche by looking at the shape of a snowflake. Another example in biology is uh, synchronization between fireflies. So this is known to happen, but if you would study one insect, you can study the insect to death. You would never expect this to uh, occur. And today I'm going to be talking about uh, you know, many body uh, emergent uh, behavior uh, in quantum optics that is called DP superradiance. Uh, and in this case, it is um, synchronization, synchronization between atoms that arises because they are exchanging photons that leads to an avalanche of photons, okay? And a very rapid release of them. So I'm interested in this problem because here it is dissipation, okay, uh, like emission, what produces coherence in the system uh, and a robust behavior. Um, and uh, this is an example of many body physics in an open system, a system that is open to the environment. Uh, but you can have oh. the <laughs> 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 so an open system, <laughs> Um, okay, so should I just like talk over it or? Does anyone know how to mute the Yeah. I muted it. Okay. Oh, you got it. Excellent. Um, okay, so yeah, so after all, uh, I'm interested in the system not only because dissipation is what leads to coherence, um, and also because uh, this happens in an open system and in reality, all systems are open, and open quantum systems are important. And so let me start by talking to you or telling you what an open system is. And so um, an open system is that that is uh, embedded in an environment. So an environment is a much bigger physical system with many degrees of freedom and can be considered noisy. We're not going to keep track of these many, many degrees of freedom. Okay. And so our system is exchanging energy and information with uh, this environment. And so because the environment is very, very large, uh, if the system is put in contact with it, 
is going to start experiencing loss and dissipation. And so imagine that we have an excitation in our system. So this is like this red dot. Um, after some time, this uh, excitation is going to jump out of the environment. And then once it is in the environment, it's going to rapidly dissipate, OK? So um, this notion of having a system that is uh, open means that irreversibility is unavoidable. And so we as physicists, uh, we don't like loss very much. We would rather be dealing with Hamiltonians all the time. So that's why we do a lot of engineering and protect systems. Uh, basically, we close them, OK? Uh, and so this is generic, uh, what I said about open systems. But today, I'm going to be talking about open quantum systems. And in quantum physics, um, openness is really a deeper problem. It doesn't lead only to the loss of excitations but it also leads to the loss of quantum coherence. Uh, and so it is dissipation what traditionally makes quantum systems uh, fragile. And so if you lose coherence, then you lose your resource uh, to develop applications in metrology or in quantum computation. So, you know, dissipation is kind of a bad problem. OK, so I in particular work in quantum optics. And in quantum optics, dissipation is not something you can magically switch off. Um, and this is because if we have an atom and it's uh, you know, here in free space, we could hold it with a laser. This atom is always seeing the vacuum, the environment um, that is represented by the infinite modes of the electromagnetic field. Um, and so let's imagine that we have a the model of an atom and this is a two-level system, so gamma and excited state separated by some energy gap. <coughs> Uh, and if we place the atom in the excited state, which we can do with, with a laser, um, this atom is going to fill this environment, and uh, it's going to produce fluctuations in this environment are going to produce the atom to uh, be the excited. And so imagine that we're going, we're going to put a detector and we're going to track the population of this atom versus time. Uh, and so if uh, we are uh, uh, in our detector, by noticing lack of photons, we can uh, understand that the atom is in the excited state. And then at some point, our detector will click. Then we know that the atom has emitted a photon. It has decayed to the ground state. Uh, and it has done that, at least if you're a theory, through the action of a, what is called a jump operator, the sigma minus type of operator that brings you from the excited to the ground state. OK, so now let's uh, imagine that we're going to do this thought experiment again. So we place again our atom in the excited state, and we place the detector, and eventually we detect a photon. And this detection happens at another time. And this is because, again, this is a stochastic process. It's random, and the time where we detect the photon is you know, random. So we do it again, and then our detector clicks at another time, um, and so on and so forth. So I should say that the, not only the uh, detection is a random process, but also the photons are in principle emitted all over the place. And so, you know, which detector would click would depend on the position, but it's also random. And on average, when you reconstruct all these processes of emission, in time, you would get this exponential decay with a rate that is given by the spontaneous emission rate that is determined by the environment. And on average, especially, you would recover a dipole pattern. So, um, so this is an example of you know, the fact that because it's an open system, we have stochasticity. Uh, and second, that dissipation matters. So I just talked about having uh, an atom in an excited state, but if we will have the atom in a superposition state between ground and excited state, the um, coherence will survive for the time dictated by this spontaneous emission rate. So that's why understanding what is the mechanism for loss is important in quantum optics. OK, so dissipation so far, I presented it as a pretty bad thing. Is this always the case? And the answer is no. So um, it is known that there are many situations where dissipation leads to order, OK? And fluctuations lead to order and self-organization. Uh, so this tends to happen in uh, systems that are far from equilibrium, that are nonlinear, and that, are con that consist of many particles or uh, agents. So examples include. Uh, lasers. Uh, there are other examples uh, like Turing patterns and some uh, chemical reactions with very complicated names that I cannot pronounce. Uh, and then if you go, you know, you sum up to things that you, we could relate a bit more, 
um, examples of self-organized systems that are open are cities, where you know the cities exchanging information and energy with the environment all the time. Yet we have a high degree of organizational city. And another example is our own body, which you know is in contact with the environment. Yet I'm a person, and not the tallest, but somewhat tall. Okay, so uh, you know um, the point is that dissipation is not always bad, and therefore we can ask the question: Can we use dissipation as a resource to generate coherence um, and quantum coherent behavior? And the answer is yes. Uh, in particular, that dissipation is correlated. So what do I mean by that? Imagine that we have multiple atoms and they are sharing the same bath, which means the same electromagnetic vacuum. This means that every time that an atom emits a photon, it can be picked up by another neighboring atom. And so this leads to correlations and entanglement between the atoms. Uh, and from the perspective of photons, this leads because of constructive or destructive interference in photon emission and absorption. So um, this is the type of physics that I'm going to be discussing today. Uh, and when I think about you know, dissipation driving order or generating order, um, I tend to think about Ilya Prigogin. So I've done a deep dive into um, the work of Ilya Prigogin. So he won the Nobel Prize in Chemistry in 1977. He's one of the pioneers of dissipative structure. So if you're not familiar with him, he has amazing books also like, you know, for like almost like popular science books. And he has this sentence in one of them that says that irreversibility leads to coherence, um, to effects that encompass billions and billions of particles. So I'm not going to be that ambitious today, but I'm going to talk about how irreversibility leads to coherence uh, with many atoms. And so why am I asking these questions besides I hope that, you know, are interesting? Um, there is an additional motivation, and it's the recent development of... Um, experimental setups where people are able to trap many atoms together um, and form order structures. Uh, so one thing I should say is that these ideas of interference matter specifically in cases where you have order. This is where interference is important. So uh, here is an example of different types of arrays uh, where you have uh, on this side, uh, these are atoms trapped with optical tweezers. Every point that you see there is an atom fluorescing. In principle, the loading of the twister is stochastic, but people can uh, then create order arrays in 1D, in 2D. You can also, if you're a fan of your city, then you can also like make, uh, this is Chicago, this is Paris, so you can be creative. Um, people are also able to produce arrays of other types of emitters, like artificial atoms. So uh, on that side, you have, I don't know if you see my mouse, I guess not, but anyway. Uh, on that side, you have um, quantum dots that are generated by placing a 2D material on top of silicon nanopillars that produce uh, confinement to the um, electrons. And so um, this generates these dots that are blinking. Uh, and while these are uh, optical sources of light, um, the type of physics that I'm going to discuss today can also be explored in the microwave with, for instance, superconducting qubits mm -hmm. coupled to transmission lines. So, Instead of thinking about a 3D vacuum, like free space, we're going to be talking about a 1D vacuum. Okay, but same ideas apply. And so in this type of situations, we can have um, you know, interference in how atoms emit uh, an absorbed light. And this is going to give rise to at least two types of behavior. One is subradiance, which is basically one can produce dark states. These are collective states that's, that um, where you, know, you have excitations in a superposition that prevents them to decay. And so this is very interesting if you want to make a state live for very long. If you are able to produce a dark state, that would give you that. Uh, another example that is actually the opposite of that, but it's also collective, is super radiant. So it's a situation where many atoms are going to radiate much more than a single one. Okay, And so um, in this type of uh, platforms, I would claim that they are very exciting to do uh, many body physics, but not just many body physics with, uh, you know, Hamiltonian many body physics of condensed matter like systems, but also open dissipative many body physics. And so um, I should also say that in the history of quantum optics, people have worked mostly in two type of regimes. One has been um, few atoms in a cavity. In that case, a cavity provides one optical mode. And so you have a situation where you have 
a lot of control, but you don't have very much complexity. There is another situation where you have many, many atoms in a cloud um, where they are inter, you know, like uh, interacting with the many optical modes of free space. So you have a lot of complexity, but very little control. And now these ideas of you know, arrays are um, kind of combining the best of both worlds where you have you know, order um, that provides control, but also complexity because you have, in principle, many excitations and you have free space that provides many optical modes. So people have used atomic arrays to do, as I said, you know, uh, many body physics with uh, you know, more, like, more like a condensed matter approach to it, so quantum simulation for Hamiltonian spin models. But today I'm going to talk about dissipative version. Okay, so now the last experimental slide that I wanted to show is that people have started to, you know, go in this direction in the recent years. So uh, these are two experiments that have shown these ideas of how interference matters in uh, arrays. Uh, here on the, I guess, right, I have an experiment of the group of Manuel Block where they send light to a a 2D layer of atoms that are in an array. If the distance between the atoms is smaller than the wavelength of the light, this behaves as a perfect mirror. So this happens because of interference. Um, and the other example is one done with superconducting qubits, where they are able to drive um, to a basically a dark state. So one of these states that live for very long times. So they do some tricks to access it. So both uh, of these papers are examples in different regimes of uh, uh, or different domains of this like collective behavior, but they are both done in a single excitation regime. So basically you have one atom excited, you don't know which one in a superposition, but in some sense, the complexity is not that very much. So the question is, how do we push this further to the regime of truly many body physics? Not where we have many particles, but where we have many, many excitations. Uh, and that's an open question because you know, many body physics is hard. And so if you make it open, it's even worse. Okay, so with this, I'm going to arrive to kind of the topic of my talk that is Dicky super radiance. So what is Dicky super radiance? This is the first example of a many body problem in quantum optics that I know of. Um, this was uh, studied or first understood by Dicky in 1954. He wrote a very influential paper and the idea is the following. Imagine that you have a system with many excitations. So you take many atoms and you flip all of them such that they are all in the excited state. If the atoms are very far away from each other, when they decay, they are going to not see their neighbors and they are going to decay independently from each other. So with these like random clicks that eventually when they, you average them, you get like this exponential decay, okay? Okay, now what happens if you place all the atoms exactly at the same point or in a cavity such that they see their neighbors. Then the physics becomes completely different. And this leads to this burst in the uh, photon emission rate. So basically you start from a situation where there is no coherence in the system. The atoms are in a product state, but a vacuum fluctuations trigger the emission of the first photon. And this basically imprints a set of phases that makes the same, the same type of photon wanted to be emitted again. So basically this leads to some effective synchronization. As atoms decay, coherence start to build up and this leads to the buildup of a dipole moment and the release of the energy in a burst. So it's an example of macroscopic coherence through dissipation. And the point here is that many atoms behave differently, not just more. Um, and it's not that they decay faster, it's that they decay in a profoundly different way. Um, and this has been observed in multiple systems. So they have seen uh, super radiance in cavities, of course, in dense clouds in free space, uh, with uh, both Einstein condensates, in solid state systems, and uh, sulfur oxides, I think recently also with atoms coupled to nanofibers. And also they are, this Dicky super radiance is also useful to develop applications. So you can build different types of lasers, like super radiant lasers, and you can use this phenomenon to generate multi-photon uh, states that have use for metrology. Okay, so why am I telling you this? If Dicky solved this problem in 1954, um, because he solved it in a very specific case, that is when all the atoms are exactly at the same point or in a cavity. So this is a situation where you have a high degree of symmetry in the dynamics. 
and this makes the whole problem solvable. So if now you try to think about what happens in an extended system, such as these arrays, this symmetry is broken. It doesn't exist anymore. And so the computing the full dynamics becomes exponentially hard. So the question that I'm going to address today is what is the many body decay of extended systems? And so I'm going to be talking about two types of systems. The first one is atomic arrays in 3D vacuum, so in free space. So here we have interactions between the atoms that are long range, uh, but that they depend on the distance between the atoms. Okay. Um, and to make things worse, in a cavity, you always emit into the cavity mode. Here, you can emit in all directions. So you know, if you think about synchronization, that sounds like a bad idea. Uh, the second problem that I'm going to be talking about is um, atoms coupled to a wavelength or superconducting qubits coupled to a transmission line, so a one debug. Here, the uh, range of interactions is infinite, which is good if you think about synchronization. On the other hand, um, there might be some parasitic or local decay that uh, is not collective, and it's going to fight against super -brainers. And so and the last part of this uh, uh, talk will be about what have, I mean, what is the effect of these super radiance uh, in the statistics of the emitted photons? Okay, so let's start by the beginning. So if you have any questions, I'm happy to answer them. If not, I'm gonna show you like three slides with equations. <laughs> okay, do this. Okay, so let's go. Okay, so I said that uh, this part. So how do we solve this problem? We have a bunch of atoms. They are talking with a bunch of electromagnetic modes, our Hilbert space scales as two to the n times the many optical modes, so pretty bad problem. So the first thing that we do is we trace out the electromagnetic modes and we end up with an open uh, system with long range interactions that are coherent and dissipative. So how do we describe this in terms of this master equation? This is a master equation only for the atoms, for the spins, okay? Where we have that the evolution of our um, system uh, is dictated by Hamiltonian. This is a coherent evolution. It conserves the number of excitations. So whenever an atom decays, another atom will go up. Okay. And then we have the dissipative part that accounts for the fact that sometimes you know photons fly away and you never get them back. And so this is the Lindblad part. And so this Lindblad part um, shows that dissipation is correlating. That's why my gamma is gamma ij, it depends on atom i and on atom j. And this is given by, again, the boundary condition. So if I have free space, these gammas will have some form. If I'm in a cavity, another. If I'm in a mirror or close to a fiber, another. OK, but this is relatively easy to build. OK, you can think of these gamma ideas where I'm coming from 1 to n as a matrix. OK, so how atom 1 interacts with itself, with atom 2, with atom 3, and so on. So an n by n matrix. So if we look at a cavity, what happens in a cavity is that these couplings are all the same. Also, if I'm on resonance with the cavity, I throw away my Hamiltonian. And if that's the case because of symmetry, um, this instead of exploring the full Hilbert space, I'm restricted to a subset of permutationally symmetric states. So basically, atoms become indistinguishable. And that constrains the dynamics so that the problem of Dicke superradiance is solvable. So in a cavity, the idea is pretty easy to understand. We have a situation where the initial state is all the atoms excited. Uh, a photon is emitted into the cavity, and this produces a hole. So one atom is now in the ground state. We just don't know which one. So now it's in a superposition. Then a second photon is emitted. So now we have two holes in our, uh, uh, in our system. And so basically, every time that a photon is emitted, it imprints a set of faces in the atoms that makes it more likely to emit. And that is what enhances the rate of emission. Okay. And so you can think of the superradiance in the following way. It's basically an avalanche. We have a quantum fluctuation that triggers the emission of photons. And very importantly, it does so. Yeah, I mean, I don't ski, and also I don't have, uh, so I only ski in conferences, and I, I don't have fear. So like I ski terribly, but I would throw myself there. Every time that I show this to a person that knows how to ski, it's like, oh my God, I'm like, that was fun. Anyway, <laughs> so that, so I guess, um, yeah, um, anyway, yes. So far I have survived, but uh, yeah, hopefully the guy also survived. So if you run into Anna at a ski conference, don't go skiing one. <laughs> <laughs> you know, Utah, PQE, 
I had a friend that came with me and broke a rib. So we just went up to the hill and just like, it was like continuous falling, but oh, wow. <laughs> worked for me. Uh, <laughs> okay, uh, so okay, back to um, where we were. Um, the important thing is like, not that uh, this sounds cool, but that this uh, avalanche of photons happens not because it's triggered by a fluctuation, which is true, but also because all the snow is going into a given decay channel that is given by the mountain ridge, okay? And that is basically the cavity. The cavity is collecting all the photons. The mountain ridge is collecting all the snow. This is why the avalanche happens. And this is important when we compare it to what happens in free space, where we don't have mirrors to, you know, provide this decay channel. Okay, so... Uh, now let's think about free space. So now I said that now these couplings are going to depend on the distance. So atom one with atom two talks differently than with atom three and so on and so forth. So now uh, this symmetry that we had before is broken and that's pretty bad uh, if you want to do, you know, numerics, for instance, or think about the problem. So what we're going to do is we're going to take this equation. And I said before that you can think of this gamma as a matrix. So I'm going to diagonalize my matrix. Again, there is nothing magical here. It's like n by n matrix. I can do this in mathematically, very simple, 10 to the 6 atoms. Okay, I diagonalize it. Um, and I can write my master equation in this way. So now I have collective jump operators. So if you recall before, we had one atom that went from the excited to the ground state with the action of a sigma minus operator. So now we have a superposition of sigma minus operators because we don't know which atom emitted the photon. Okay? And so these alphas are basically the phases of this uh, um, jump operator, okay? So uh, it comes from the eigenvector of this matrix. It tells you spatially how it looks like, okay? Uh, and the decay rates are the eigenvalues of this matrix. There are n jump operators, and these decay rates can be many of them zero, very different, very similar, and so on. It's all determined by the boundary conditions. So for instance, in a cavity, there is only one, all the others are zero. There is only one jump operator. In free space, in principle, we have as many as atoms. And it is the distance between the atoms and the lattice dimensionality what determines whether some of them are large or not, or some of them are small. Why is that? Uh, it's interference. So basically, this means um, whenever a jump operator acts on, on the chain, it uh, means the emission of a photon. So you can, you can imagine that if you have now an array, uh, you're going to have many modes that, you know, you might have constructive interference in like this plane and destructive in this one. So it's, it tells you about this. So once you have like this pattern, basically, uh, that pattern is like antennas. If you want, it's going to radiate mostly in one direction and very little in another and so on. So there will be modes that are have very large decay rate because of constructive interference and modes that will have very small decay rate because of destructive interference. And the interference depends, again, on the distance. If the atoms are very far away, then you don't have interference. So you have many collective modes, but all of them have decay rate gamma zero. And if the atoms are very close, then you may have, for instance, many that are dark. Um, and then from the perspective of the photons, um, each of these jump operators represents a photon with some well-defined uh, profile in the particle. Okay, so now do you remember how pretty it was the picture of the atom like in the cavity going down, you know, like a very well developed and established and simplified way of going from the excited to the ground state. Now we're going to do this in a general case where we don't have symmetry. So I'm going to do the same. This is the number of excitations from N to zero. I initiate everything in the excited state, from the ground state. In principle, I have to do the N states. Um, and then I'm going to, when I act with a jump operator, it kind of go down, but now, you know, I have many states, so, because symmetry does not constrain me. And second, I said that I only, not only I have one jump operator, I have many, so now I have a bunch of them. And then not only this, I have the Hamiltonian. And the Hamiltonian conserves a number of excitations, so the jumps bring me down in a very complicated way, and the Hamiltonian scrambles me, in a plane of fixed number of excitations. So now this is this horrible thing. This is the, what you don't, when you don't have symmetry, you deal with this. So that's why symmetry is possible. Okay, so how do we do, do and how do we attempt to solve this problem? Uh, so we are going to first make a guess. 
So this is the case. So imagine that I have a lattice. I'm going to give you the example in 1D, but this is generic, okay? I have a lattice and this lattice, the atoms are very, very far away. If they are far away, they do not interact with each other. If I look at the photon emission rate, it should decay in a boring way, okay? If the atoms are all in the same point, I go back to the DT situation where I have a burst. So the question is what happens in between? Is there a critical distance where I lose my burst? And how do I go about calculating? So the first thing I'm going to do is I'm going to calculate it. And so this is the solution. So this is the normalized uh, photon emission rate versus time for different geometries. So chain ring to be. Uh, so we learned several things from here. The first thing is that dimensionality matters. Clearly 2D does much better than 1D. The second thing is that this is a horrible plot because this plot we can only do for 16 atoms. And so this uh, beautiful 2D array is only a four by four array. There is no computer that can solve six by six exactly in the world. So like if we would go at it just from a purely numerical way, we're toast pretty much. So, so this is the average emission rate? That's the average, yeah. How much does it vary shot to shot? Uh, it, it can change, yes. So it again, it depends on the distance and so on, but I'm going to talk about that. Right, okay. Yes, a little bit uh, in the end. Yes. Any other question? Yes. So I see the one D array case is not that different from with the periodic on our condition of flight. Can you maybe yes. just apply periodic condition to the 2D array? Does that also yield a similar result? If you have your right boundary condition, you can assume. I mean, we didn't easy. really impose any boundary conditions. We literally put the yeah, atoms a in a ring. As approximation like for the 2D. For example, maybe on a sphere or something, so that you can just just so that you can apply same standard. I think it would be like a torus, but I mean if I I don't know how to distribute 16 atoms in a torus, you know. <laughs> <laughs> it's kind of a problem. Like uh, maybe, maybe. I mean, so I think approximation my point is th there are there are approximations also that you could um, try to do. None of them are awesome. And my whole point is that you can maybe overcome this in a different way. Uh, yeah, but one thing that I should point out is that this uh, this ring geometry, we did it because in the literature you find like there's this amazing paper by Harosh where, uh, I mean, it's a beautiful review of DP super radiance and many ways super radiance, but back in the day, people were fighting a lot about what geometries would preserve super radiance. And one of the questions was, well, maybe um, super radiance gets quenched because of the Hamiltonian interaction that goes as one over R cube. So if atoms are close to each other, they are going to deface very rapidly. And this is going to lead to loss of super radiance. But, and this depends on, you know, the environment. So if you now, if you have a chain, the atoms in the edge are going to see a different environment than the atoms in the middle. So why don't we close the chain to make a ring? Then you have permutation symmetry and maybe everything is great. And the answer is no, like it does as poorly as the chain. I'm gonna explain why. So there is a reason for this. Yeah, okay. So then what do we do? Um, is this all that we can do? Answer is no, thank God. Um, next thing that we can do because we are theories is we can switch off things. So the first thing that we did is we switched off the Hamiltonian evolution. And we saw that at the level of the burst, very little things happen. So the Hamiltonian is not doing very much. So let's forget about it. Does it make sense? Yes, because it's mostly dissipative. So it makes sense that the Nimbla part, the dissipative part is uh, the part that matters the most. OK, so we have to understand these jumps so, and what they are doing. So the next thing that we're going to do is, again, because we are theorists, we can do whatever we want. We're going to take a 1D chain. Yes, pretty uh, sorry. Uh, we are going to take a 1D universal chain. Universal posture of theorists. <laughs> I mean, I'm also useless as a person, so I cannot uh, oh, switch on oh, a laser God. or anything. So uh, there are reasons, but yes, I think theory is more versatile. But anyway, uh, OK, so we can talk about that at another moment. Um, so what, else, what other type of like computational exercise we can do is we put all the atoms in the same point. We should have these DT bursts. And then we're going to like spread them, OK? And as we spread them, what you see is that these bursts go down, as we would expect. But what you also realize is that very easily I can predict whether I'm going to have a burst just by looking at the early dynamics. So I'm not going to be able to tell you how big it is going to be. But it's either like this derivative is positive or negative, 
is going to determine everything. And then if you think about it from the perspective of an avalanche or a synchronization mechanism, it makes sense. Either you have the conditions for synchronization and this happens in the beginning, or it never happens at all. And so if you have this insight, then what you can do is you can say, OK, I'm going to look at the derivative and predict whether I'm going to have a burst or not. We can do this numerically, but um, we can also be a bit more elegant. Uh, and so to be a bit more elegant, what you can do is you can define a minimum burst. So what's a minimum burst is that the second photon is enhanced because the first one has been emitted. OK, so this is the minimal condition for a burst to happen. So you can compute that in terms of a second order correlation function at equal zero. So if the probability of emitting two photons is higher than the probability of emitting one square, then uh, you get a micron size burst. And if you don't, then you will never get a burst and we're done. So to compute this, actually, it's like just one page of algebra. And this is the solution. So it's very simple. Uh, you're going to have a burst if the variance of these decay rates that I mentioned before is larger than one. So this equation is interesting for several reasons. First, I can uh, compute this uh, by just diagonalizing an n by n matrix, which is typically something done with a complexity like n squared or n cubed. Actually, computing the variance I can do linearly with n, so I can go to very large systems. The second thing, and I think it's the most valuable one, is that this equation provides insight uh, as to what super radiance happens to begin with. So basically, it's very simple. You just want dominant decay channels. So it goes back again to the picture of the avalanche. In a cavity, you are placing uh, mirrors, and these mirrors are telling the atoms emit here. And that's a dominant decay channel. In free space, the atoms, the photons can be emitted all over the place. And this means that these uh, jump operators or decay channels are competing between them. So what you want is that you know, a couple of them win the fight. And the others are like, oh, yeah, I'm not going to even try. OK? So the idea is that, you know, uh, if from the picture of the avalanche, an avalanche would never happen if you have many, many mountain ridges. Eventually, the Earth becomes flat. You know, you don't have a mountain anymore, so you don't have an avalanche. So here, the picture is very similar. Yeah, you have it. How, how does it work just in the, the simple Dickey model where there's only yeah. one? Yeah, yeah. So then the variance is uh, for n larger than one. Yeah. Sorry, in larger than two is larger than one. So that's it. Like in the in the case of Vicky, you have one uh, one uh, jump operator yeah. that they are of decay rate n gamma, and the others are zero. So you can compute when the variance of that set is larger than one, and it's when n is larger than two. Sure. And that's when you have. It's very simple. Okay, so same thing. Yeah, yeah. It's like this condition is universal. It works for order, disorder, cavity, free space, wave guide, whatever you tell me, more or less, it can work. So can I can I use this same expression to figure out whether like an avalanche photodiode is going to be an avalanche mode? I have no idea. I actually thought that, I mean, this super, I thought about using super radiance as a photon detector, which I don't know if it would work or not, but then I don't know if I can use this condition for that, maybe, I don't know. So it's, should I think of this as like the trace of the square of the evolution super operator? Uh, it's simpler than that. It's of the dissipative coefficients of that. So like if it would be just the evolution super operator, again, that scales uh, like two to the n or four to n. Like it's not diagonalizing the Limblad, it's diagonalizing the matrix that determines the uh, system. OK, so, uh, so the picture is the following. Um, Dissipation either gives a super radiance or you know quenches it. So if uh, one jump operator is dominant, it will produce the emission of photons into that channel, and it will make this emission reinforces the pattern, right? So it's basically you're reinforcing the phase all the time. If on the other hand uh, you emit a photon into some channel and then you emit the photon in another direction, you imprint different set of phases that lead to defacing. So basically, this is the idea. And um, in, a, in a cavity, as I said, this uh, dominance comes from directly putting the boundary conditions in mirror. In free space, this comes from interference. So this is an emergent thing. It means that it's going to depend on the dimensionality of the lattice and on the uh, uh, lattice constant. And it means also that 
For uh, finite systems, there will be a critical distance beyond which super radiance will not happen. And so what is a critical distance? We can calculate it because now we can do calculations for very large systems. And, yes. Oh, gamma zero is the largest one. Gamma zero, sorry, this is the spontaneous emission rate of a single uh, atom. Yeah, it's just a normalization. Yes. So, like if it's rubidium, I don't know, some transitions like six megahertz. Like transcript color, like this, and we enter in. What is the. If you do just take one atom oh, yeah. and you, you measure how long it takes to lose okay. uh, the excitation, the half lifetime is given by one over gamma. One more question. Um, so those two conditions are equivalent. They are is that the same as saying that, uh, are you also saying that the G2 is given by that variance or, the, or, or that's not? Uh, it's uh, it's the variance plus one over blah, 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 something. So you can rewrite the G2 in terms of the variance. Cool, yeah. awesome. Yes. Um, so I was wondering about the high order correlation functions like G3, it just seems like those would have to scale very yes, fast. yes. So you could look at G3, it would be like the second derivative and so on. Uh, this is actually important because we looked into, so okay, so G3 you can relate to um, the variance and this skew of the matrix. And I think you could relate, uh, but it becomes more complicated. And you could think of Gn as different n momenta of the matrix, the distribution of these eigenvalues. But it's complete, we tried, it's complicated. Because it's not just like G2 goes with the variance, G3 goes with the skew, it's G3 already goes with the skew and the variance, and it's a complicated expression of them. Uh, however, calculating G3 is important because we wanted to have this picture in mind that you know you don't want a situation where the emission of the second photon is not enhanced and then the third is enhanced. So we did calculate that, and in certain cases, we could prove just by properties of the matrix that this can never happen. Uh, then another thing that I should say is that remember that we are forgetting Hamiltonian evolution. So in principle, you know, you would have like emission of a photon with a jump operator, Hamiltonian evolution for some time, then another. So it's not just computing Gn at t equals zero, tau equals zero. It won't tell you all the dynamics. So you have to be careful about that as well. So I hope that that answered your question. Okay. Okay, so then uh, we can go back to extended arrays and use our condition and see Try to understand, you know, get some physics out of this math. And so this is what we found. So we calculated this critical distance beyond which we don't have super radiance. We see that the critical, so we did that for 1D, 2D, and 3D arrays. Again, it's always 3D vacuum, but we changed the dimensionality of the array. And we see different behaviors. The first thing is that in 2D, this critical distance scales to logarithmically with atom number. In 3D, the scales given faster than that, it scales as a power law with atom number. So this is remarkable because of several things. The first one is that this seems to be pretty universal. The lattice geometry doesn't matter, the dimensionality matters. Um, second, DT super radiance should happen, at least like a minimal version of it. For systems not very small as, you know, DT predicted like all atoms in the same point, but actually extremely extended systems should be able to display DT super radiance. Um, and uh, one other thing that we I am not showing you is that in 2D and in 3D, this critical distance grows with atom number. In 1D, it saturates. It saturates to around 0.3 lambda, where lambda is the wavelength of the atomic transition that we care about. And so this already tells you something about the origin physical mechanism behind big superradiance. And so big superradiance is a transient phenomenon, but there are things that make it sound a little bit like uh, you know, the physics of phase transitions, even though it's not a phase transition. And so let me explain what that is. So imagine that you are looking at the IC model and looking at whether uh, it sustains a, a, a phase transition. So when you lower the temperature below a critical temperature, you will have order. Uh, and this depends on the dimension, right? So in, uh, for the IC model, you have that 2D is the lowest critical dimension. And this is because in 1D, you don't have enough neighbors to sustain long range order. So here, what is happening is somewhat similar. In 1D, uh, you do not have enough neighbors to sustain a strong constructive interference. Therefore, Dicky superradiance in 1D does not happen because of constructive interference. 
it happens because of destructive interference. It should not even happen. We just live in a world where we have destructive interference and it's the mechanism, you know, like, so for the variance, you can either make some uh, decay rates very large because of constructive interference, or you can have like a kind of uh, weakish channels and you can switch off some of them because of destructive interference. And this is what happens in one day. So one day is basically pathology. And then one thing that I've mentioned before is that uh, in what uh, mode we are emitting, uh, we are emitting in the mode that is given by, basically determined by this uh, dominant uh, decay rate. So it's emergent, okay? So for instance, in 2D, it will be in the plane of the array. Okay, yes. Um, is, is there an issue with the aspect ratio? I know in 3D there's this like, Tensile clouds do it better. Yes, 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 for sure. So in 2D, for instance, um, this is related to your question. You see why? So for instance, in 2D, if you put your, uh, uh, basically the transition is perpendicular to the plane, it will emit like in the plane. Uh, but then if you tilt the dipole, then it will only, in the far field, this dipole cannot radiate. So it will be only in this direction. And the best thing that you can do is then you can shrink such that you know you have some rectangular thing that would be ideal so then you basically everything we did is for order arrays but once you realize that in 2d and above this thing happens because of constructive interference things with disorder arrays should be similar and so that's why these pencil shaped geometries work better and so so you can can you get close form solutions for the disordered arrays or no uh, I think one thing that would be neat is to use uh, like random matrix theories to think about like this like uh, distribution of eigenvalues. One thing that I should say is that arrays are very good for a reason uh, that is that as I showed you the Hamiltonian doesn't go in super radiance. And this is again because all the atoms are seeing more or less the neighbors at the same distance. In a cloud, if it's too, uh, if it's not dense enough, there won't be super radiance. And if it's very dense, also, there will not be super radiance. And this is because the atoms can be arbitrarily close and they can deface each other. So in, a, in an array, this doesn't happen because all the neighbors, you know, the Hamiltonian is switched on, but just produce a global phase accumulation only in the edges. But the edges is like one over the n type of problem, bulk versus edges. So then like the Hamiltonian, who cares? It matters at like at a long time, it matters because you get trapped in dark states. But for the burst, it doesn't matter. I guess I was just confused because I had thought in 3D that the density doesn't matter. It's just the optical density along the optical the dimension. Yeah, the optical density. But there will be a point where if you get super dense. Yeah, high densities. But I would think at low densities, there's no lower limit to the density. That I if you, there will, I mean, if it's like, imagine that you go to a density where you have one atom. You will lose it. No? But not if my optical depth is high. No, no, exactly. So if you have, but that's exactly the thing. You can always compensate with n. I see. Got yes, it. that's Got the idea. It. Yes. So if you you can always compensate with the optical depth. Yes. Okay. So then uh, now I want to briefly talk about uh, one D. So here, this is a typical different type of bar. Uh, similar physics happens. So I want to go through this pretty quickly, but I'm going to talk about. Um, what does this mean in particular for the direction of emission? So as I said, now if we look at wave guide QB, we have a situation where we have a bunch of qubits, for instance, coupled to a wave guide. They can be coupled at different rates, gamma left and gamma right. They can also have some local dissipation rate, gamma prime. You see that super radiance happens, and it depends on the distance between the atoms. Okay, So there are like optimal distances. Um, and so the decay rate, this matrix, uh, again, uh, is case like that. This is basically it's like the Purcell enhancement permitting to the left, to the right, and then a propagation factor that comes from propagation in 1D. Um, and so um, because now we have the photons confined to 1D, basically you only have two jump operators. You can emit to the left, or you can emit to the right, or a superposition between left and right. So it means that super radiance is going to happen very naturally because you have n minus two moles that are already dark. So that's already a win. Also notice that this interaction is periodic and there are special distances into which, at which there is only one uh, jump operator that is non-zero. And this is basically the big limit. So this happens at uh, whenever the distance between the atoms is five. 
in order of the inverse weight vector. Okay, so just to say that you can repeat more or less, although it's a bit subtle because we have local dissipation, this parasitic rate, you can repeat everything. You can look at situations where you have very uh, large coupling to the wavelength versus free space, like supercomputer in qubits by transmission line. Situations where the opposite is true, where it is more similar to uh, atoms coupled to nanofibers. You can look at order systems, disorder systems, and then you can extract a condition that is basically the same as before, but then you also have to overcome the parasitic decay. But now, the last thing that I want to mention is what happens with respect to the photons. Okay, so we know that they are emitted in a burst, but what happens shot to shot a little bit? And so uh, you have to, I mean, my picture of the is better. Oh, okay, hopefully everything works. Let's give Anna a round of uh, <laughs> uh, Maybe it doesn't work. Right. I think we should probably unplug and read the traditional experimental. Exactly. <laughs> we're, we're, we're not sophisticated people. Do you have any grad students or postdocs people who actually work in the lab? <laughs> <laughs> Last time we had to press a button over here. Oh, yeah, that's true. I'll authentically press all of the buttons. Oh, here we go. Yay. Okay. okay. So, uh, okay. So again, we have a fluctuation. Um, and what does this fluctuation mean with respect to emission direction? So we're going to emit the first photon either to the left or to the right. We don't know. But once it is emitted and detected in the left, it means that it is more likely that the second will be emitted to the left and the next and the next and the next. So basically, you can think of this process of amplification of this uh, uh, fluctuation as a process that breaks mirror symmetry. And it does so spontaneously and in a dynamical manner. It's reinforced through the dynamics. And the question is, is this true? And the answer is yes. So this is a plot that we did where we initialize our systems. We do this many, many times. And uh, we look at the probability distribution of having a photon imbalance in the detectors. And so shot to shot, the pictures will look very different. But what you find is that in most cases, you either detect the 16 photons to the left in the detector of the left, or the 16 photons in the detector of the right. Um, this is for a perfectly bidirectional wavetide. In the case of a chiral wavetide, where a single atom is more likely to emit to the right, Actually, this, yeah, exactly, to the left. Uh, the chiral, the wavefront becomes way more chiral, okay? So it is enhanced collectively. Um, and so the next question that we want to ask, and we have not the answer yet, is that, well, we now have a directional source of light. Having said that, this is stochastic. Sometimes you get it to the right, sometimes you get it to the left, but it's like all the photons or most photons will go in that direction. Um, what is the quantum statistics of the photons that are emitted? Um, there are papers that have looked into this in the case of this Dickey limit, where you actually don't have this directionality. And these are photons that have meteorological advantages. So we would like to explore that. OK, so with this, I'm pretty much done. Um, I just wanted to mention some of the projects that we're interested in um, working on or that we're working on. So we are uh, looking at super radiance in realistic systems. So basically, in a 2D arrays of strontium and iterbium um, atoms, arrays, 2D arrays. Um, and this is because basically these atoms have some transitions that are very short wavelengths that you can use to trap the atoms, and then some very long transitions uh, for doing the science. So uh, then you are in this condition, you know, like even though the critical distance is large, you should still be below a certain uh, distance. Uh, so we're looking into this, and the results are promising. If somebody's interested in that, I have a slide about this. Uh, then we'd like to uh, drag this system so that these connections with statistical mechanics can be done in a more you know, reasonable footing. And then that opens up the question of, can we have a laser without a cavity, where you know the emission is correlated and directional, the incoherent pumping is the strain correlations, the decay is creating them. Maybe there is a rate where this sustains, you know, produces a coherent uh, source of light. 
I would like to explore what types of photons come out of this process. Um, maybe you can have uh, um, entangled photons uh, uh, of metrological advantage. Uh, and one thing that also we are very interested in is from the perspective of the atoms, instead of preparing dark states, which are hard, can we decay into dark states? So through process of repeated photon emission, can we get trapped into an atomic state that is dark and would not decay? And so this is um, something that uh, we're also looking at. If this is basically thinking of this dissipative evolution, um, you know, developing methods for uh, computing dissipative evolution instead of having to solve these like problems in the you know Hilbert space that escapes us to the end, can we have basically an evolution that is adapted to the problem. So you're only going to consider states that are produced by the jump operators. So you are thinking about these dynamics in terms of basically a branching process. Um, and through this branching process, perhaps through a measurement and feedback, one can get trapped into some state and you know produce um, that state. And the last thing I wanted to mention is we're interested in looking at Greenberg arrays and what does it mean for like these platforms uh, that do like uh, Hamiltonian uh, quantum simulation or uh, quantum computation. What is this, the role of uh, collective dissipation there? Um, and I'd like to know about astronomical masters because these are objects that exist and that produce coherent light and you know are out there in the space. And I'd like to understand them. So if you know something about them, you can talk to me. Uh, so I'd like to acknowledge everybody um, that uh, has been involved in this work, in particular. Uh, Stuart, my postdoc, and Eric, uh, and my student that have uh, done amazing work on the free space part, and Sylvia and Zoe, who have uh, taken care of the wave guide. And if you're interested, here are some references. Um, thank you. I have just a quick question. So you mentioned the constructive, uh, constructive mode or destructive mode of the decay. What exactly it means, like in physical system, but like uh, you know, we know constructed pattern of the pattern, but uh, how do you picture it in your like array system? Yeah, yeah. So at the level of passing an excitation, atoms are really like antennas. So literally. So you basically, uh, you could produce. I mean, whenever you create coherence between the ground and excited, you are producing, inducing a dipole, right? Uh, and so now you would produce a dipole pattern. And that dipole pattern has a set of faces that radiate like literally like an antenna. And the different modes of radiation, like over there, over there, over there, over there, this corresponds to the different collective modes. So if you work in like um, this, um, I think even in like a, uh, nanophotonics, like people do this LIDAR, like where they can direct, like they have a waveguide arrays and depending on the face, they can run uh, direct beams. So because of constructive and destructive interference. So here is a little bit the same. The problem is, is when you have many uh, excitations, the problem becomes quantum mechanical. So there is a part of like, you know, how these modes look optically that there is like, is similar, but then you have this complexity that comes from when well, you cannot put Two excitations on the same atom. There are going to be, you know, correlations of quantum origin. Like, how do you deal with that? That is different. But the constructive and destructive interference, there is a very much of it that is very similar. So, for instance, the uh, problem of uh, the mirror that uh, of the block group. Literally, if you do this with metallic nanoparticles, the same thing exactly happens. The part that uh, the physics are discussed. It won't because there you really require quantum. Thank you. Uh, yes, just but to remind the, uh, everybody, the faculty don't get to ask the first two questions. The first two have to come from the students. So if you feel ignored, it's also because uh, all I have is sunglasses, so I can't see people further back. But uh, how does uh, measurement back action come into the physics? I wish I could tell you the answer. Um, I mean, the dynamics is a stochastic, so it means that if I, I cannot hope to flip all my atoms, watch them decay, and hope for the best, right? Because then, like, the best is going to be some horrible mixed state. So I need to track the photons that come out, 
which means that now I have really like a pure state type of evolution. And ideally, in an ideal world, and I don't know if the time scales are right for this, but in an ideal world, I would like see the photon that comes out. I'm like, is this a photon that I want in my, you know, I think of these dynamics as a, like a pinball, you know, it's like, it's going down, the Hamiltonian is scrambling things, things are getting moved, but it's like, okay, I detect, I know where I am, and then maybe I can operate in my system. I can send the photon back, I can send another photon that kicks, you know, the the state like uh, add some impart some additional phase, you know, so something like that. It's not probably not going to be pretty. I would never do this in free space because how are you going to detect all these photons? But in a waveguide or in cavity slash or waveguide with mirror or something that is similar to maybe the DT case of a cavity, but where you have a little bit more of degrees of freedom, like uh, you know Hamiltonian evolution or maybe one additional jump operator where you can play. Um, that's how to do it, but we don't have a protocol yet. Thank you. Next is Jason. Uh, in the results for the uh, critical distance versus atom number that you showed for the 3D, and the, so for the 3D array, it was like you're putting like a square root of n on there. A square root of n. Yeah. yeah. Do, do you or yeah? Do you understand? Well, actually, it's n1d, so it's actually n1d, yeah, n yeah. to the one over six. So do you do you have any intuition for that scaling? Like, is there a physical? Yes. But this, well, physical intuition, no. Uh, mathematical <laughs> intuition, yes. So um, <laughs> we did the this. The points are numerics, and the lines are um, analytical curves. And this comes. I think I have a probably a slide. Oh no, this is very slow. <laughs> okay, I really want to show it. Um, I have many plots, bear with me. Uh, yeah, okay, so this is it. So you can, in the case of an infinite lattice, you can solve this in momentum space. So basically this condition of the variance becomes an integral of gamma of k squared. Okay. So basically this is how, uh, if you have now, um, imagine a 2D lattice, which is what I'm showing here, 2D lattice, uh, you can go to um, Brillo and Sum, okay? And so there are going to be uh, regions in that region and some that are going to correspond to bright modes and some that are dark, okay? So these are here. So this is like dark, and then here you have like an enhanced decay. And this is basically because the atoms want to decay in certain directions with certain wave vectors, okay? And so uh, you can, so basically these um, dominant decay channels are basically in the space, these ones. And this one's in 1D, and, and you have the scaling, this is numerically, but you, oh, numerically with finite systems, you can see how these decay rates scale with them. And so for 1D, they saturate, there is no divergence. In 2D, there is a divergence of the scale like square root of n, and in 3D, it goes as 10, okay? So this is not this variance, is the, or this condition, the critical distance, sorry, is just these decay rates, their scaling. And again, like it makes sense that the scaling is faster and faster with them as the dimension increases because it's more and more constructive interference. And so, from the perspective of the um, this like reciprocal of this picture, um, you basically have to integrate. And so, you're going to have these divergences, and you approach these divergences uh, with an error that the scales as one over n to some power. So, okay, so there is like the propagator goes as one over k minus k zero. So it's like the typical dimensional integrals that you find in like also like phase transitions. So, and how you approach them with depends on how fine you are dry, 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 um, grinning or driving this uh, reciprocal lattice. And so you can uh, obtain all that. It's complicated because it's a mess, but if you want to see algebra, it's there. But basically, it's the exact scaling is hard to pin down. It makes sense that you cross with them, and it comes from divergences in the space. Okay, so we're going to take one more question, but then let me point out there are some open slots on the schedule tomorrow if you'd like to chat with Anna. Uh, and also, there's a lunch for graduate students and postdocs tomorrow that everyone is invited to sign up for and attend. So let's take our last question. Hi. Uh, so. Uh, I, uh, I have a question regarding the variability because right now you're talking about atoms which have a certain tau zero and you're assuming it's a homogeneous system. Yeah. So is there an error at all? Let's say the wavelength of emission, the decay rate, mm -hmm. when you're doing an experiment, yeah. none of this remains the same. Yeah. 
Okay, so the good news is that super resilient <coughs> samples of broadening the language is very robust against uh, defects. So dark states have been very important for me, but also very frustrating because anything breaks them. Super radiance is not like that. So we have looked at a spatial disorder. We have looked at in a continuous broadening in the frequencies. We have looked at non-radiative, um, so basically local non-radiative decay. And the answer is always, you can always compensate it with more emitters. So if you have problems with 100, then do 500. <laughs> so there is always, you know, and that's, I mean, you're laughing, but with dark states, like there is no compensation, right? Because you're always narrowing the line with, with uh, this is not the case. So I can show you pictures later if you want, but yeah. we have analyzed all that. Let's take Anna again.